This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. What does it mean to be musical? 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 What does it mean? What does it mean to be musical? Why is music such a potent form of human expression? How do musicians select, interpret, and perform compositions? What's distinctive about the human voice? We've asked six extraordinary scholars and artists to explore the magic that is music. Welcome to UC San Diego. Welcome to the Conrad Prebis Music Center. Welcome to the second season of the Making of the Modern World Lecture Series. My name is Alan Houston. I'm the Provost of Eleanor Roosevelt College. I am delighted to see you here this evening. The purpose of this series is simple. It is to make available to you, to parents, alumni, faculty, students, to members of the community, to make available to you some of the most extraordinary treasures of UC San Diego. It's artists, it's teachers, it's scholars. Steve Cassidy is a professor of Slavic and Comparative Literature. He's also an Associate Dean uh, in the Division of Graduate Studies. For seven years, he was the director of the Making of the Modern World program, and I believe that was a reminder from someone of the importance of turning off cell phones. <laughs> Thank you for that reminder to everyone. So Steve Cassidy is uh, a, lecture, a professor of literature as well as an administrator in graduate studies. He uh, was the director of Making to the Modern World. In a few weeks, he will be a performer in this series and talking about the rise of atonal music for this evening. However, he is our moderator, Stephen Cassidy. Thank you, Alan. I can't tell you how thrilled I am to see so many of you here tonight. You know, we began this series 10 years ago in a very modest way. We took a break for a couple of years, and once Alan became provost, he and I got together and said, we really have to start this all over again. And we thought, we'd just shoot for the moon. We'd go big, to be human. Imagine giving a lecture series on a topic of that nature. And we were blown away when it seemed within minutes of opening up registration, the thing was sold out with a waiting list of over 100. And the same thing happened again this year. But it occurred to me there was really no reason to be surprised. And that's because of the amazing, wonderful community we have here in San Diego. It's because of all of you who came here tonight and so many of you who came last year. So again, thank you so much. Um, we will not disappoint this year, trust me. This is going to be a terrific series. What we thought we'd do this year, we thought, you know, UCSD presents all kinds of fantastic music all the time. You can come here almost every night of any week and listen to amazing performances by our faculty, students, and others. But what we thought is, wouldn't it be great to hear some of those performers not only show us their art, but explain it to us, especially for some of the challenging music that UCSD is so very well known for. So we chose four of the music department's best known performers. We added a guy from literature and finished off with a psychologist of music, Diana Deutsch, who will be talking to us in a few weeks about how the human brain creates and processes music. And so now, without wasting time, I'd like to move on and present tonight's performer. Steve Schick actually needs very little in the way of an introduction. He's been at UCSD since 1991. He was the founding member of the Bang on a Can All-Stars 
from 1992 for a decade till 2002. He currently runs Redfish Bluefish, I guess with thanks and apologies to one of UCSD's familiar figures, Ted Geisel. In addition to that, in his spare time, he is the music director of the La Jolla Symphony, the chorus and artistic director of the San Francisco Contemporary Music Players. He's the author of one of the rare books on the percussionist's art. It's called That, with the subtitle, Same Bed, Different Dreams. He's a wonderful, fanciful, imaginative writer. And finally, he is the author of a three-CD set of the complete percussion music of Yanis Xenakis, a composer whose Psafa will be featured on tonight's program. Just one quick note before I bring Steve Schick out onto stage. Um, this program, by contrast with all the others, will include a very short intermission during which Steve Schick will be changing the um, uh, instruments on stage, and then we'll come back and uh, he gets to perform a little longer than the rest of us, which is an honor for all of us. So please join me in welcoming to the stage, Steve Schick.
Percussion is so simple. <laughs> On stage, there are dozens of instruments. They're taken from a store of hundreds of instruments we have in the studios here at UCSD. Those are a small part of thousands and thousands of instruments found in percussion traditions all over the world. And yet, all of those instruments have one thing in common. There are simple objects that make sound by striking them. And they work by unbelievably simple rules. If you hit them, they make a sound. If you hit them harder, they make a louder sound. If you hit them a little less hard, they make a softer sound. And that's really all you need to know. And I think I might be almost done with my lecture. <clears throat> it feels, in fact, a little embarrassing to be here lecturing in such an august series as this on the campus of one of the nation's premier research universities about such a simple thing as this. And in fact, uh, percussion as a study at the academy, at the university, is a really pretty recent one. Um, when I came to the University of Iowa as a transfer student in 1973, that was the very year the first doctorate of musical arts, the first DMA, was given in percussion studies. Um, now, scattered through the audience, you probably will find uh, one of six doctoral students currently working here at UC San Diego in the music department. We've graduated 18 doctoral students since I arrived 20-some uh, years ago. So it's a flourishing art right now, but it wasn't always. In fact, it seemed for a long time like the academy didn't really want to have very much to do with percussion, and you can hardly blame it. It's so simple. It's so easy. It's so commonsensical. Why would you want to teach that? A philosophy colleague here can trace his or her roots back to the dons of Oxford. Uh, not me. These idea of a, of a professor of percussion, it still, you know, it still uh, brings about some snickers when you, when you say that, is so, is so recent. And when I was a student at Iowa, it was so clear why. I would walk uh, along the hallways and I would hear my classmates, the violinists, the cellists, the pianists, practicing. And they would be play, playing Bach cello suites, or the Hammerklavier Sonata of Beethoven, or something like that. And I would go back to my room and see if I could bow a break drum from a 1972 Valiant, for example, or see what it would sound like to play a cowbell underwater, <laughs> or uh, what if you hit the music stand with the gong? Uh, these were the experiments that we, we did. And the wonderful thing, as I know you know already, about having exceedingly low expectations is that you always satisfy at that point. <laughs> when I was in the high school band, really, if we didn't light someone's head on fire, it was a good day. The conductor you know, waved us off. Good rehearsal, no casualties. Um, and in fact, the vaunted name percussionist really was a pretty recent arrival in my life. I thought of myself as a drummer, and you know, believe me, there's there's a great and grand tradition of drumming, and I, I say that with all respect, but I wouldn't have dared to have been an ist. Being an ist is special. If you're an ist, you're a pianist or a violist, and like all ists, your force of definition comes from th something central, something commonly held. In the case of musical instruments, it comes from the object itself that's played. A pianist never wonders what he or she is or why he or she goes to the practice room. You go to the practice room to play the piano. It's that icon on stage, that either expensive piece of furniture or the wonderful music-making machine, depending on, how, on what you use it for in your house. And when you, went, when you go to buy a pianist a, a, a gift for Christmas, you know to buy that person one of those sweaters with black and white keys on it. <laughs> or a coffee cup that has a little piano lid. You never wonder. A pianist is an ist because the entire practice is related to the piano. And in fact, that, isn't that the definition of being an ist? That you know that the force of cohesion comes from the inside and emanates outward. All ists, violists, flutists, Methodists, anarchists, all of them <laughs> have this central driving force. Percussionist may be the single exception to that. In fact, the single exception, I remember uh, being on tour with Bang and a Can and with my good friend David Lang, with whom I was a, a, a classmate at the University of Iowa. We were in Latvia. We were doing a, uh, one of the, when, we, when, you, when you play in Eastern Europe, you do these kind of um, obligatory press conferences. There was one in Vilnius. And someone was asking about how many instruments I played. And 
I started mentioning them, and David turned to me in the, in the press conference and said, you know, you have so many instruments, it's like you don't have an instrument. <laughs> and it's true. The constellation of percussion instruments, the atomization of the musical object around a percussionist is so extreme that you can't actually say that the practice comes from the, from the center of anything. The practice, in fact, emanates from the constellation of sound makers that you have around you, and one accretes the practice. In fact, the absolutely only thing that percussionists have in common, it is not the objects that we play, it's what we do to them. We hit them. Schlagzeug, the German word for percussion, says it best. Schlag means to strike, and Zeug means stuff. This is what we do. <laughs> we strike stuff. Now, in, I promise, nearly the only moment tonight in which I will actually say something instructive to you, I'm going to give you my equation for what it means to be a percussionist versus another instrument. Let's say for the sake of discussion that it takes 10,000 sounds in order to have a, a, a substantial, a robust musical practice. 10,000 sounds that you would deploy as different tone colors, different pitches, different loudnesses. And by the way, that's a number borrowed from John Cage, and it's a low number. I read 15 years ago that there were 25,000 possible combinations of orders at Starbucks. And that must certainly have tripled by now. So the idea of, of needing 10,000 sounds, that's already a small, it's a small number. But the equation for an instrument like the cello or the violin or the, or the flute is n times 10,000 equals 10,000, where n equals 1. In other words, it's the activation of a single object by uh, 10,000 different kinds of playing techniques that will produce the richness in sonority, in texture, in polyphony, in melodic line that is necessary to, to carry on a robust musical practice. But the definition for percussion is n times 1 equals 10,000, where n equals 10,000. In other words, if we want to, in the, in the most pure theoretical way, if we want to make 10,000 sounds, in essence, we probably need 10,000 instruments. We need 10,000 objects. Uh, a composer would come in with a very typical story and say, you know, I'd like to write a piece for three woodblocks. Well, immediately you try to dissuade that person from a solo piece for three <laughs> woodblocks. That's another story. But soon enough, if, if that person is convinced that the, that the great solo work should be for three woodblocks, at some point, he or she will come to you, knock on the door, and say, you know, three woodblocks is not going to do it. Uh, I need three woodblocks and a tambourine and a cymbal. And then they will go on their way and come back in a week and say, I'm going to add a timpani. You know, my wonderful colleague, Chinri Ung, uh, wrote a piece for the cellist Maya Beiser and me, and Chinri promised me it was going to be a small, easily portable piece, and when he called me to ask me what the pitch was from the Javanese low gong that I have in my office that is this big, I realized that it, this was not going to be a small piece at all. But that's the typical percussion scenario. So with that idea that I've given you actually something that involves numbers and uh, in multiplication signs, and have done something at least for you tonight, let me stop to roll the credits. I'm really happy to be here. And I'm really, really happy that you're here. And I hope that you come back and see the future programs in this wonderful series, To Be Musical. And very, very grateful to Alan, to Steve, Eleanor Roosevelt College. And I'm especially grateful to UC San Diego. One doesn't get the chance to say this aloud very often, but I would be a very different, a very less rich person intellectually, culturally, and personally if it hadn't been for this university. So I want to say thank you. Thank you to the university, and thank you for housing the work, the kind of work that we do and making this possible. Now, um, I think in order for us to have a conversation about percussion, you should have uh, some idea of history. I have prepared, and I'm willing to time myself, on a five minute and 35 second <laughs> history of percussion music starting now. <laughs> percussion um, is a worldwide art form that goes back thousands of years. And that has to be said strongly at the beginning. My little teeny niche is just that. It's a little teeny niche of a great ancient worldwide tradition that includes gamelan and tabla and African drumming and Latin American marimba playing and orchestral playing and in, in, in middle-aged insurance agents playing along with KISS records in their garage, whatever. It's a huge tradition. My little spot of that tradition is in the world of contemporary classical music, and actually notated contemporary classical music. Except for the beautiful piece by Gustavo Aguilar that you just heard at the beginning, which I improvised, everything that you hear tonight is, is written down and notated, learned, and memorized in order to be performed. 
And uh, so for me, history goes back into the 19th, 18th and 19th century classical, Western classical tradition, for me. And for that, I need to look at the orchestra and the use of, of percussion in the orchestra. In the eight, late 18th and early 19th century, percussion uh, did two things. It was both a part of the orchestra and a part from the orchestra. In other words, percussion mated with and spoke to the sounds of the orchestra. If you hear a, a down bow in, a, in, a con, in contrabass, it's not hard to imagine why the sound of the timpani fits in with that sound. If you hear the attack of a brass instrument, it's not that far from imagining what a cymbal would sound like. And so early percussion was an extraction, an essentialized version of the noises that already existed in the orchestra. It was also something else. It was also apart from the orchestra, and it was imported from the outside. Outside, literally, in terms of the outdoors, the environmental sounds, percussion that sounds like the, 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 the rolling of thunder. Um, and in fact, percussion instruments themselves are outdoor instruments. They're made to be heard across uh, big distances. Uh, in fact, one of the very first pieces I, I, I don't have this. Well, here, let me play the, one of the, 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 in fact, the very first piece I ever played in a, in a concert. play it on a, on a timpani covered with bells. I played it on a <laughs> snare drum. But that's the downfall of Paris. <clears throat> Military drumming with the idea of sending messages across large distances in the outdoors was really the root of all of these, all of these instruments. And so it was a part of the orchestra, but it was also this exotic thing, this otherness, right, that brought in uh, both the, um, the color and the allure of the, out, of the world outside the concert hall, but also some of its danger. Another place that people, uh, composers, imported percussion from was uh, outside of Europe. You, you know this already. If you, if you, if you know the, the Ninth Beethoven Symphony, especially the last movement, you know that Beethoven imported from Turkey, from the near Middle East, these Janissary instruments of cymbals and bells and jingles and drums. You know the variation? And we can sing along even. But those instruments that go along with that come from a Turkish tradition. And Beethoven's audience knew, I mean, they knew, this was basically Beethoven's uh, sh showing us how he could accessorize. He took a melody that belonged in the, in the concert hall and he dressed it up with this wild, exotic new color, this new sort of uh, fashionable flavor. And so, Along the lines of the, all along the line of the 19th century, percussion became increasingly colorized by these sounds that were brought in from the outside, but then became a part of the language, became inside. And so the necessity was then, of course, to bring in more sounds. So that by the time you get to the large orchestras at the end of the 19th century, the percussion sections are enormous. The, lots of drums and cymbals and interesting mallets and all of these kinds of things, to the point where the center dissolved. Yet again, percussion is involved with the creation of entropy and the destruction of the center somehow. So that in the early 20th century, composers felt that it was possible, just maybe, to write pieces for percussion alone. And they did. Uh, starting with Edgar Varese in 1931 with his, uh, we the, still one of the greatest pieces, if not the greatest piece we have in our repertory, Ionization, a piece for 13 percussionists, and an explosion of American interest in, uh, in, in percussion from John Cage, Lou Harris, and Henry Cowell. Those were the symptoms. The causes beneath that could be found in a lot of different places, and two need to be mentioned now. One is African American music of which we all have nearly daily contact, if not daily contact. The drum set, you know, the, 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 the cornerstone of African-American musical practice, in my, in my humble opinion, is really the, um, the bringing together of a marching band drum section. So you have snare drummers and, and cymbal players and bass drummers. You put them all together and you let your feet play two instruments and your hands play other instruments, and you have then suddenly this language that comes out of, out of the drum set. And so the cohesive force, the one that, that counteracted the entropic force, came from African-American music, music, and to some extent also, in my opinion, the European tradition of Dada. Dada was this form that was both sound poetry and sculpture, and it found 
objects that had lost their utility, that were cast away, that were really just uh, refuse, and bound them together into meaningful art forms. Kurt Schwitters did this in his sculptures and also his sound poetry. Do you know the beginning of the, of the Or Sonata? It's a 35-minute uh, sound poem of nonsense syllables arranged in musical, uh, uh, musical form. I will not be performing the entirety of the Or Sonata for you, but here's how it sounds like. Firms bevertate u per gif kivi e, de desen n r i e, and puf til to tul hu ka rinsk de bebe and skermu, tsiu and zetsu, rinskermu, rak de bebe. Tsiu and zetsu, rinskermu, tsiu and zetsu, rinskermu, rak de bebe, rak de bebe. None of that means a thing. Just like none of these objects mean a thing until you co cohere them, until you put them together in, under the umbrella of a kind of musical form. And we come finally, and oh yeah, I'm doing actually okay. Um, we come finally to solo percussion music, which is the thing I'm gonna to talk to you about tonight. Now the solo percussion music is such a recent advent that it occurred to me on my 50th birthday that I was in fact older than the oldest solo piece in my repertoire, which is a crazy thing. It's a crazy thing, because imagine a pianist being older than the oldest piece in his or her repertory. We know some who seem that way. <laughs> it's, not, it's not what I'm talking about. And, but you know, the oldest piece that I, the, the, I count the first piece as being the 1956 uh, piece by John Cage, 27 minutes, 10.554 seconds for a percussionist. That was made in 1956, I was made in 1954. So I'm older than the oldest piece, which is a crazy thing. And so it brings back all of these sort of thoughts of the myths of origination that musicians always play. This is a late night, you know, over a glass of wine kind of game, where you say, can you imagine what it would have been like to be there at the Champs Elysees uh, when the Rite of Spring was premiered and, and maybe throw a tomato at the stage, or can you imagine hearing the first performance of a late Beethoven quartet, or, or tapping, tapping Mr. Brahms on his shoulder to ask him what he thought at the premiere of his second symphony, all of these things, and people then look off in a kind of reverie and think, ah, what, wouldn't it have been fabulous to be there? And friends, in the world of percussion, we are there. This is the age in which we live. The masterpieces, the cornerstones of the repertoire, the way in which my students and I speak about our world, the things that we do every day in the practice room, all of those pieces, at least in terms of the solo repertory, were made over the course of my lifetime. And in, even in very young percussionists, those who are studying now, uh, have seen the birth of an, of an art form. It's unbelievably exciting. It's absolutely fantastically exciting. And it leads us to a very, very interesting situation. Percussionists, we like to think of ourselves as uh, rebels, as revolutionaries. We love uh, to quote the, the, the famous saying by John Cage in 1938 where he said, percussion music is revolution. But we actually really have not that much in common with revolutionaries, especially when you compare to how much we have in common to the early Christians. This is how I think of the percussionists now. We are the early Christians. And I mean that in a very serious way and also in a very specific way, which is to say that all of the composers whose works comprise the foundation of our art, uh, well, not all, but nearly all of them have died in the recent past. I'm thinking of, of Stockhausen, whom uh, you'll hear later on. Yanis Sinakis died uh, 11 years ago. John Cage died. Morton Feldman, Lou Harrison. Uh, uh, it, you, one after another, the people who, who contributed to the formation of our art are gone, and all of the percussionists who championed their music with the exception of one, Max Newhaus, we're all alive. So we have this crazy thing in which you hear percussionists of my age and older say, I knew him, here is what he said to me. Here is what he said to me. And so the conversations between older percussionists and younger percussionists sound a lot like the, the, like the early church at Antioch, the, the great divide between St. Peter and St. Paul, where Paul claimed authenticity because he knew Jesus, I mean, rather, Peter claimed authenticity because he knew Jesus, and Paul said, but I understand the spirit. Now, we don't have exactly that conversation, but there's something that's very, very similar to that, where I do my best to resist saying, Zanakis told me, by the way, that he doesn't really like it that way. <laughs> I do my best to resist saying that because it can't be that we're creating a gospel. It has to be that we, we're creating a language. And the only way that you can create a language is to forget about the, he said this to me. You have to make all those capital H's small H's if we're going to have a, a future. 
Uh, and so I say that to you as a, by way of introduction of the three pieces, the three repertoire pieces which I'll play for you. The first one is the, is the one to my right. This is Helmut Lachenmann's Interieur One, written in 1966. Helmut told me, no, I'm not going to do that to you. <laughs> Although, he told me a lot of things. Um, and and, and Lachenmann is an interesting composer for, for many, many, many reasons. But the title of this piece actually really says what we need to know about it, which is that it's about the interior. It's about what does the inside of a sound feel and sound like. We think of a sound as a thing. A sound is actually multiple things happening all at once that are blended together so that our ears and our mi mind perceive them as a single coherent object. But if you take a sound apart, a violinist can do this by playing a harmonic. Uh, percussionists can do this by scraping or rubbing so that you don't get the entirety of a sound. You get part of it. You're allowed actually to turn a sound inside out and see what it's made of. That's what happens in this piece. And it's a piece written in 1966. This is, in, in essence, the fourth piece that was written. I mean, this is, what we, this is how close we are to the beginning. We know them in their order. First, there was 27 minutes, 10.554 seconds for percussionists. Then there was Zyklus in 1959 by Karl Heinz Stockhausen. Then in 1964, The King of Denmark. And then in 1966, Interieur by Helmut Lachenmann. This is, these are the, the, the cards that we, we trade in. So what I'd like to do, and this seems like an, just even in teacher school, we learned you know, to shut up after a while and do something else. <laughs> Actually, we don't learn that. You probably knew that already. Uh, but I'd like to play uh, interior for you. And, and then perhaps uh, you'll have a, uh, some thoughts and questions. And we'll have a little question and answer period right after that. So without any further ado, let me play the Helmut Lachenmann solo from 1966, interior number one. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> You're very kind uh, to, co to come back after intermission. I think that's a. Uh, it's a very good sign. Uh, that piece is Safa, written in 1975 by the Greek composer, born in Romania, lived in Greece, and then eventually settled in France after the Civil War, Yanis Sinakis. And it's one of the earliest pieces that I learned. Uh, in fact, my first trip to New York uh, from Iowa 
and I was as green off the farm as it was possible to be, uh, was to hear the American premiere of this piece. And it was really a, kind of an astonishing, and amazing, an amazing experience for me. So uh, it was a, it's a pleasure to play it for you. And uh, since I played it for the first time in tonight, I think there have been something like 800 performances in between now and then. I've played it for quite a, quite a long time. It feels like it's a part of my body. In fact, it, 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 really, it really is. You know, you stand on your left foot like this <laughs> so that you could play. And I, this is a stupid story, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Uh, so I was his per personal trainer the other day. And uh, he said, well, what you need to do is to rotate your left hip in a certain way. And I said, you know, it really just doesn't go that way anymore. It's, uh, <laughs> you can blame it on Safa. <laughs> so the, uh, maybe this is the second thing I'll say to you that I think might be worth saying. And that is that you know the Euclidean common notion of equivalencies. This is how I think about Safa. In other words, the, but Euclid meant if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. So the voice inspires this piece. The voice then equals the body, because the vocal uh, cadences of Sophic poetry are represented in the music, but it's, it's, of course, instantiated by the body. And then the body produces gesture, which are you know, basically compact physical movements. If you make art out of gesture, it becomes choreography. So if the voice, voice equals the body, the body equals gesture, gesture equals choreography. Choreography equals architecture in an interesting way, because choreography talks about where you can be, where you're allowed to inhabit, and where you're not allowed to inhabit. And that's, of course, the, 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 the underlying principle of, of architecture. Architecture is a way of dealing with form and with the organization of ideas and ideals. And so from the voice, to form, from the voice to architecture, is one uh, long set of, or actually not even so long, right? A set of equivalencies along a path that, that, that Euclid foresaw. It's no wonder that Xenakis is also, is also Greek. And, and I think that this means that for me, this goes back to your, your thought earlier, uh, that percussion is not a mechanical art form. In fact, it's a very malleable art form. In fact, the least important thing we do is to hit things. The most important thing we do is to raise the stick. That's what the, where the art is. I mean, literally, and, I, and, I, and I'm not being the slightest bit facetious, I can teach anyone to play percussion in about six seconds. You've already done it. All, it, it lowering the stick, that's really, that's not hard to do. The, the art is in raising it. The art is in raising it and poising it just so that this, a certain kind of lowering is, is instantiated. And so this is what I get from Safa, that it's not about, it's, it's a loud piece, it's vigorous, it's rhythmic, but it's not really, it's not really about that at all. It, it is really about, it's really about the voice. And so we have uh, these great uh, landmarks of, of percussion music. You've heard Anterior, you've just heard Safa. And uh, you're about to hear Tsiklus, which I'll play quickly so we can have a little time uh, for, uh, for questions and for, uh, for conversation. But before we, we do that, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about an interpretive approach. In other words, what does it mean to be a player of this instrument? What is it, how, do you, how does the instrument engage you? And I, I, I use models all the time when I think about interpretations, you know, just simple mental models, like many, so many of us do. But uh, one that, that applies in the case of of, of Safa is what I call, or I, I've borrowed the title, um, uh, The Fifth Business. And um, The Fifth Business talks about, um, talks about the, the way in which, um, in classic tragedy, forces are equal. The protagonist and the antagonist, the villain and the confidant. And in fact, if you have a good tragedy, like Rome, Romeo and Juliet, if you add a Montague, you also have to have a Capulet. You, you can't, you can't the, you, the game cannot be a foregone conclusion at the end. So the best kinds of tra uh, uh, tragedies are totally balanced. And Robertson Davies wrote this book called The Fifth Business, in which he said, every successful tragedy has to have then a fifth element, something that throws the system off of its balance, something that means that it will go someplace. And so in all of these percussion pieces, they are rationalized and mechanical almost, but I'm looking for the thing that doesn't belong, the, the catalytic element that will allow the piece to develop heat. Because a balanced system doesn't make heat. It just sits there. And so in this particular case, the thing that, 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 that throws, for me, the fifth business is always the fact that I have a pair of instruments 
and a third instrument, a pair of bongos and a lower tom-tom, a pair of tom-toms and a low bass drum. And so every time, it's not three equal steps, it's two equal steps and one that's a little bit lower. So that whenever you have a complex, it never feels like it wants to come to rest. It always feels like there's something driving it forward. And it helps, a model like that helps, that, uh, that I, again, have, have borrowed from Robertson Davies, uh, a model like that helps us know what to do next, what stick to take, what instrument to choose. And these are really, really important things. The model for, um, for Tsiklus, which is the piece I've hurriedly set up and I hope everything is there, um, over the break, I, I want to show you the score to Tsiklus. You, you're not going to be able to s read it, but I think you can see. You, here it is, by the way. Uh, so I got this. Um, I learned this piece and started this piece in 1974. It was written in 1959, so at the, at the moment I started learning it, it was still kind of a new piece. Now it's a, you know, a classic and quite an old piece. And I was so naive. I mean, the depths of my naivete have never been truly measured. It's an unmeasurable, actually. <laughs> And so I got this score, and uh, my first thought was, OK, well, let me find the first page. And I realized soon enough that it's, there isn't actually a first page. This is bound on a spiral, and you just keep spinning them. <laughs> you can go forever. I won't tell you how long I did that. <laughs> <laughs> and the interesting thing is that every page if you, can you imagine that this is a kind of circular arrangement of instruments, if you, can, if you can see that? It's a circular, as circular as you can get if you have a straight marimba and a straight vibraphone. And every page corresponds to a segment of this circle. So you have this thing, it's in a spiral form, but it's, it's mapped onto this kind of circle. And the, th the great thing about it is that, that Stockhausen, the German composer Karl Stockhausen, says, you can choose your starting spot. I, t I, start, I start right here. But I could start here. I start, where I start, I'm facing this direction. But if I started on this page, I'd be facing this direction. Do you see? Because every single page refers to a certain segment of that circle. And so then when you read the piece in its order, it takes you around the circle. So you begin with a note, and you end with that same note. And at that point, you close this circle. Right? You close the circle. And so if that weren't enough, by the way, you can play it this way. That was a tough day, by the way, when I started trying to figure that thing out. <laughs> Mom. Um, and so uh, the way I play it, I am led around the circle in a counterclockwise direction if you, if you view it from above. But if you played it this way, you would be led around the circle in a, in a, in a clockwise direction. So what's with that? All of that freedom, right? Because Mozart never did that. I mean, he never said, oh, you can play the first movement first, the second movement. It doesn't really make any difference. Play the left hand and the right hand part. I mean, no. And so what I find really interesting is the amount of freedom that is a part of early percussion pieces. We talked a little bit about the score to Anterior and the freedoms of rhythm that that have. This is a, different, a completely different level. Now, I should say that once you make those decisions, every single note that I play is written down. That I'm not purposefully inventing any pitches, at least. And um, there are some other smaller choices that I think we probably won't go into because of time. But basically, you have these freedoms, and sometimes the freedom to reorder some events in a, in a phrase. But otherwise, every note is written, every instrument is stipulated, everything is, is given. You just have these basic freedoms. So the intuition, and the reason I think the reason that I'm a percussionist and not a doctor at this moment is that for me, art resides at the crossroads of this highly rationalized process that we've talked a little bit about, and this completely unknowable and personal process. Now, that crossroads is a long ways from a stage of a classical music hall. It's a long ways from a university. It's a long ways from the commercial world of record sales and contracts. But at that point, when you run out of things that you can think about and you start having to feel about them, then you start making art. And this piece, to me, which is the first piece I ever learned, uh, is, is exactly that. Now, for me, the model of this piece resides in a fantastic short st story by the German author Heinrich Böll. It's my favorite short story. It's actually my favorite love story. And before I play this, I need to tell you the story because, you know, it's just a great thing. It's called um, An der Brücke, On the Bridge. And um, it's the story of a, of a wounded World War II veteran who is given a civil service job. This is a, a, in eastern Germany. 
And uh, because he's wounded and because it's a, the social state, he's given a job counting people who cross a bridge. He sits on the bridge, on Debrucke, and he counts people. And of course, the local authorities need this. They need to know uh, when they need a new bridge, and the, the numbers of people who cross every day are, are, are notated and actualized and percentualized and, and, and stored for posterity. And, and he starts to realize that uh, if he's feeling good on a good day, he can raise the number of people and it makes the, the mayor very, very happy. If, he's, if his leg hurts on a certain day, then he lowers the number of people and everybody is grim and dour. Now, the thing that's interesting about this very slim story is that he falls in love with a beautiful young woman whom he is deeply and truly in love with, but who she does not know he, this guy exists. He, she's completely unaware of him. He's deeply in love with her. And the only thing he can do to show his love is not to count her. It's beautiful, isn't it? And so he works, his mouth works feverishly, counting all the people until she appears, and then she, he just watches her. And not only is she not counted, but anybody who happens to cross the bridge at the time she's on the bridge, they are not counted either, right? It's beautiful, right? And so one day, uh, the government, the, the mayor says, or, or his friend says, by the way, the government's going to check up on you tomorrow. So just be careful, because they're going to they're check, check you. So count well. Uh, don't lose your job. And so he counts like a fiend, and the controller from the mayor's office comes and says, you have done so fantastically well, you were just one off. <laughs> so even in the face of losing his job, of, 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 he could not counter. He refused to take this beautiful thing and encase it in the cold, dark world of statistics. And so, yes, we musicians, we tend to, to think about music a lot, but when, it really, when you really press us, when you poke us for the moments that move us, it's not really about thinking about things, at least it's not in my case. So here's a piece full of noise, which to me is one of the most beautiful pieces ever written. This is a Karlein Stockhausen Zyklus.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Friends, I have one more thing to do, and, and you may have noticed when, um, when I was playing Gustavo's piece at the beginning that I was, I have this little t tape recorder. So I recorded myself playing it, and uh, as we talked earlier, one of the most fascinating things about percussion is the breaking down of boundaries, including the boundary of history. And so we are going to hear a little history of this concert. I'm going to play back the tape, and then Gustavo Aguilar, the composer of this piece called Wendell's History for Steve, he wrote it for me, asks me, while I play the tape back for you, to recite a poem of Wendell Berry called History, which is, well, you'll hear what it is. It's a very wonderful thing. So uh, with this, uh, I will uh, thank you very much for coming, and uh, here is Wendell's History. The crops were made, the leaves were down. Three frosts had lain upon the broad stone step beneath the door. As I walked away, the houses were shut, quiet under their drifting smokes. The women stooped at the hearths. Beyond the farthest tracks of any domestic beast, my way led me into a place for which I knew no names. I went by paths that bespoke intelligence and memory I did not know. Noonday held sounds of moving water, moving air, enormous stillness of old trees. Though I was weary and alone, song was near me then, wordless and gay as a deer lightly stepping learning the landmarks and the ways of that land so that I could go back if I wanted to. My mind grew new and lost the backward way. I stood at last, long hunter and child, where this valley opened, a word I seemed to know, though I had not heard it. Behind me, along the crooks and slants of my approach, a low song sang itself as patient as the light. On the valley floor, the woods grew rich. Great poplars, beeches, sycamores, walnuts, sweet gums, lindens, oaks. They stood apart and open, the winter light at rest among them. Yes, and as I came down, I heard a little stream pouring into the river. Since then, I have arrived here many times. I've come on foot, on horseback, by boat, and by machine. By earth, wind, water, and fire. I came with ax and rifle. I came with a sharp eye and the price of land. I came in bondage, and I came in freedom not worth the name. From the high outlook of that first day, I have come down 200 years across worked and wasted slopes by eroding tracks of the joyless horsepower of greed. 
through my history's despot in ruin. I have come to its remainder and here have made the beginning of a farm intended to be my art of being here. By it I will instruct my wants that they should belong to each other and to this place. Until my art comes here to learn its words, my art will be the hope of song. All the lives this place has had, I have. I eat my history day by day. Bird, butterfly, and flower pass through the seasons of my flesh. I dine and thrive on offal and old stone and am combined within the story of the ground. By this earth's life, I have its greed and innocence, its violence, its peace. Now let me feed my song upon the life that is here, that is, the life that is gone. This blood has turned to dust and liquefied again in stem and vein 10,000 times. Let what is in the flesh, O oh muse, be brought to mind. Thank you very much. <laughs>